enters like a needle and spreads like an oak tree. So where I want to start is how on earth do we start to identify the needle so it doesn't penetrate? So what are the top five questions we can ask someone to figure out whether they are a narcissist, if they can answer the question or not? Yeah, so everyone wants this, the magic questions I can ask. Like, you know, if, if listen, if those five questions existed, therapists would be using them all the time. You know, I, I tell people a couple of things when it comes to how, how do I figure out, like again, that idea of evil entering like a needle is that it is so subtle, right? But part of it though, it's almost less of what the narcissist is doing and more of the story we're telling ourselves about what they are doing. So what I mean by that is this. If you, you let's say you meet a new person, okay? I have to be honest with you, something I often ask people is I say, tell me the story of you. That's my, that's my opener. The other thing I ask people is how do you spend your days? I do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, not everyone is sort of traditionally employed and when we say what do you do, you can feel shaming. So like, tell me how you spend your days. And then they'll tell me well, how they spend their days because they're often thrown off. They're expecting me to ask them a job. So it's two questions. Tell me the story of you. Tell me how you spend your days. Okay. You ask those two questions, you're going to get a lot of data. Pay attention. The other thing you need to pay attention to, this third thing's not a question. It's how, do you, how are you feeling in your body? Without exception, and you know at this point I've talked to thousands of people who've been through narcissistic relationships. Every single one of them has said to me, it felt off to me. I just felt like a little uncomfortable, whatever it was. And I tried to talk myself out of that feeling. So it's that, in a way, it's almost an instinct. We had someone recently on my podcast um, who was talking about her meeting her deeply, malignantly narcissistic husband. And she wasn't attracted to him. And she thought the idea of kissing him, she, in her words, repulsed her. Her body was telling her something. But her therapist said, however, this guy actually is paying attention to you and he seems really nice. But there was something her body was saying, no, no, no. And then she listened to her therapist and sort of tried to quiet those voices. And it ended up being quite a life-changing disaster for her. But our bodies do tell us something. And it, paying attention to that is really, really hard because we're kind of told, get along with everybody. <laughs> but in asking those other questions, tell me the story of you, tell me how you spend your days, it's, there, there are different ways of answering that. Look for contempt. So if I were to turn up to someone and say, tell me the story of you, they'd be like, ugh, what do you mean? All right, all right for me, that's 10 red flags popping up. Oh, red, interesting. Boom. You know, because usually people will say, tell me about you, or what do you do? Those are the questions mm. people are used to having. And narcissistic people love saying what they do, because they're all that, even if they're lying about what they do. But when you put the questions in those sort of non-traditional ways, it's sort of interesting to see what kind of response you get back. And so they're giving you data, not so much in their answers, but in almost their process and in their approach. So, but I'll be frank with you, Lisa, as a therapist, we may have to spend three, four, five, six sessions with a person before we're like, wait a minute, mm. this is a narcissistic personality. And in theory, most therapists are trained to detect this. So I think when we make it like, what are those questions I can ask? I think we set an unrealistic bar for people. And then they say, oh my gosh, I guess, you know, I'm the fool who couldn't Why? figure this out. But I'm like, no, you're not mm. the fool. It takes trained people a minute. But the final piece is catch yourself in the story you're telling about this person, right? So a person can give you their story beats, even if they answer the, the story of them and the, um, the, uh, how they spend their days. And there's facts in there. I have my own business. I grew up in Michigan, whatever. Those are facts. And then there's the story you're starting to tell yourself, oh, this person's really cool. And, you know, the, um, I wonder, like, it sounds like they have a lot of a, a possibility in their life. And I have those shared interests. Once you start putting your narrative over theirs, that's the other place where you might start making mistakes because mm. then you're starting to try to make pieces fit. Mm. So we almost have to take a little bit of responsibility to say, what kind of story am I telling myself about this person? Oh, 
Oh my God, that was so good. Okay, I don't want to interrupt you, but you said so many things I'd really love to touch mm -hmm. on. Okay, so the first one, I was really surprised when you said about the, like, to ask them about their story, because I thought that I have the understanding that narcissists love to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. So how is that actually a sign? Like, I was surprised that you said they'd get frustrated. Mm -hmm. They would get frustrated because they may not like the way that question is like, tell me the story of you. And that sort of, they may roll their eyes at that. Mm. In a way, they should love that question because they're the right. ones who are always making up a story about right. themselves. I would say, now, you were asking me what are the questions you ask someone, right? Yeah. There's no, you're not going to ask someone, like, do you talk about yourself a lot? <laughs> You've got to pay attention, mm. okay? And so in paying attention to what they have to say, you may notice like, oh, they're kind of going on and on and on. But it's, I wish it was that simple, is that they only talk about themselves. Because another thing that they may do is ask you very intrusive questions about you. Um, very early on, maybe not a first date, but early texting, early phone calls, something like that, they may say things like, what's your worst fear and i i'm always a little chilled when people say we sat on the phone for 10 hours the first time we met and i'm like and what did you tell oh. them about yourself because what narcissistic people are really skilled at is learning everything about you so they can outplay you so if i sit here and i really want to outplay i'm not, i would never be able to do this because i'm not wired for that but if i really if i really let's say something tactically you know, I'm clever enough to say, okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to learn this person's vulnerabilities. I'm going to learn their weaknesses. I'm going to learn what matters to them. I'm going to learn what they feel insecure about. And now I have the keys to the kingdom. I can make this person do whatever the heck I want. But we read that as, oh, they're so interested and curious about me. So how do we, when this is a discussion we have a lot, like where's that fine line between mm -hmm. someone really is interested in you and because the last thing you want is for someone to dismiss them when someone's actually being sweet and kind and generous and like really curious about someone. Like, oh, I really want to know about you. Um, I wouldn't want to dismiss that. But to your point, if they're too curious, now does that become something that they're trying to get out of me? Where's that fine line? How do you assess that? I sort of feel like it's when they're being intrusive, right? So they may ask a question and because of their, I would say lack of empathy, they may push because they want to know more. I don't know. Let's say there's something about your um, family history. You don't want someone to know. Tell me about your family. Eh, you know what? Like, uh, suffice it to say I got a family. No, no, no. Tell me, tell me. Come on. You know, I'm getting to know you. You've said I don't want to talk about my family. You know, and then they're pushing. I would say early in a relationship, if so, you ask someone a question and they say, eh, you know, I'm going to let that go. A healthy person would say completely understand right but if a person keeps pushing what they're doing mm -hmm. is they want to see how far they can push your boundaries they're learning how elastic that this is whereas if a person says no I really don't want to talk about that I'll be frank with you if you say lay down that kind of gauntlet that kind of boundary on a first date a narcissist you're not going to get a second date and that's the best thing that could have happened to you <laughs> So, yeah, yeah you, they're not going to be interested because they're starting to see your boundaries can't be messed with. And so, you know, they, when you say, no, I'm actually not going to talk about that, they might even, um, when they don't see you again, and you're like, I wonder why they don't want to see me again, they may consider you cold, dismissive, you, you're not open. So things that you actually think of yourself as a very open person, but you have appropriate boundaries, narcissistic people fool with those qualities we want to have. We want to be open. We want to be willing to exchange ideas. But when they pathologize you and say, oh, I guess you're not that open, you're thinking, I'm open. Oh, you want to know about my family? And now you've put your cards out there and that's going to come back and haunt you. Oh, God. And so now they're literally like, oh, okay, I've just tested it. I see that mm -hmm. I can push them. And mm -hmm. so for them, it's mm -hmm. like a check. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And so, and the, but they'll keep they'll they'll keep using new and newer and newer tactics. Mm. Like, oh, I guess you know, I guess, I guess you're you, maybe you're not really looking for a relationship now since you don't want to be open. You actually are looking for a relationship, so now you're confusing two things. Listen, for all the damn time people spend in gyms, I would love it if people would actually spend time strengthening their boundaries and really saying, these are my boundaries and no one's going to mess with them. And I am very open, but I, I've got, like, it, it's going to take a minute to get to know me. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And if someone's not willing to do that, bye. Oh, I love that. Um, 
So would you then at this point talk, um, really assess your personal red flags? Because I've heard you mm -hmm, talk about, mm -hmm. look, if it was just general red mm -hmm. flags, back to what you just said about the question, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well, we would be obsolete. We wouldn't need therapists. Like here are mm -hmm. the five things to do and you're good to go. But even talking about red flags, I'm like they're not always general. They have to be personal mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. you. Can you talk to me about that? Because I thought that was so powerful, especially when we're talking, if you're just meeting someone and you're starting today, like assessing what your personal red flags are almost before you go on that date. Yeah, absolutely. So the, those personal red flags, are, we, we often think of red flags as being sort of universal things. A person who flirts with the, with the server, who screams at the people in the restaurant, who shouts at the valet parker, who demands the table right away, like entitled, rude, boorish, inappropriate stuff. Those red flags are, they're beyond red flags. They're just oh, wow. red alarms. But the some red flags might affect you and not me and vice versa. And those are based on our histories. It could be our own histories of, for example, somebody's been cheated on, right? So they're very, very, very leery of anything that feels like shady, secretive behavior. So that kind of behavior, someone who's doing a lot of texting, taking their phone into the bathroom, um, never lets it leave their side, could very well be the nature of that person's work. But the fact is that the person's reading that as, mm, I'm not comfortable with this, that becomes a personal red flag. That, for example, that behavior with a phone, whereas somebody else will be like, oh, I'm like that too. I take my phone to the bathroom just because I have my credit cards on my phone or something. <laughs> they, they, are, they, have, they, they get that. Someone might feel as though um, they're, they're afraid of rage. So somebody has a really loud you know, voice. And I, I think I'd said this even, maybe even in that video on personal red flags. I had known a woman who had a really rageful new boyfriend. And I said, whoa, what is happening? Like, this, is, this is making me uncomfortable how sort of ragey he is. I could hear his voice over the phone. He called her during dinner. And she said, oh, my dad, my dad was a rager, so it doesn't really bother me. So she was having almost an opposite reaction. Having had a rageful father, it was almost normal to her in a way, she, or, or trauma bonded for her, one or the other. So she was giving him a free pass on the rage. If somebody talked to me the way that person, it, I would end the relationship on the spot mm. because rage actually is also an issue for me and it's unsettling for me. So these personal red flags can either lead us to put up a boundary a lot earlier or we may miss them because we mm -hmm. had a previous experience. So that's why I'm saying red flags aren't always created alike. And where, you know, somebody else might say, like for me, if somebody was sort of driving too fancy a car and wearing fancy clothes, that's red flags going off like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. That stuff really makes me, I will, I will actually not talk to someone like that because of experiences I've had and what I know about that stuff. Whereas someone else would be like, wow, that person is so chic. They have such a great sense of style. So we're going to approach that person differently. Charisma makes me uncomfortable. Most people are drawn to charisma. So personal red flags come from what we know, what we've experienced, how we view ourselves, our core wounds. And that's why it's hard to talk about red flags because my red flags aren't always someone else's. Sure, there's the universal ones, but beyond that, they tend to be really personal. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. So how do you assess um, the accuracy, quote unquote, of those flags? Because if you're bringing a lot of emotion, mm -hmm. a lot of history into mm -hmm. it, to your point, you can either A, put up the boundary too early, mm -hmm. or B, not put the boundary up at all. Right. I would say that the, the challenge becomes this. For people who've already been through narcissistic relationships and have been hurt, and in some cases really felt traumatized by those relationships or just deeply wounded and hurt, I say, I'm okay with you having too many red flags. Mm. It's almost like having an overly sensitive alarm on your house. The person's mm. like, well, oh, this thing goes off when the cat walks across <laughs> the floor. I'm like, okay, you may want to adjust that a little, but you know what? Right now, your house has been burglarized 10 times. Mm. Maybe a more sensitive alarm isn't a bad thing. Mm. So it's about, it's almost viewed as a security system. If you've been harmed, I'm actually glad that your gates are so high mm. and so wide and so thick and have a 70-digit passcode. Like, I'm good with that. 
with time as you feel more authentic, more strong, more safe in your skin, have more success experiences even in non-intimate relationships, just friendships, you may start trusting your instincts more and maybe you can sort of bring down the security level a little bit. But some people say I'm overcorrecting. Like this person was, um, they talked about their ex-wife twice during dinner. I didn't want to see them again. I said, okay, so you're overcorrecting. It beats the it beats the alternative for starters, okay, of letting someone in who's really bad for you. I don't even think people have conversations with themselves about what their personal red flags are. I think everybody tries to go on these first dates and these early dates on the fly. Like they're doing they're building the airplane in the sky. And I think that's a bad idea. I actually think you need to sit down with yourself, really sit down, like just like you'd prepare for an interview or a meeting or a presentation that before you go on that date and say, okay, what are the things, what are my personal red flags, what are things that are gonna make me uncomfortable, what's my exit strategy if I don't like this, um, how do I check in with myself, you need to prepare for that. And part of that is knowing what those personal red flags are. Mm. That's so strong because I heard you also say, you know, narcissists kind of know and they kind of spot who is like the easy target. Um, and so doing all that pre-work, I think, helps build your um, your strengths. That when you're there, like if someone's pushing your boundaries, that you have clarity on the fact that they're actually trying to cross your boundary. Right. Um, so what are the things that you even said boundary pushing, they're going to test you? What other things um, do narcissistic people typically do in order to um, see who is the easy target or not? Well, it's the, it's, it's the testing. The testing is the main way they do that, right? So they may do something outlandish and they look to see if the person's going to call them out. They will push and push and have that be intrusive, ask questions, and the person may not answer them and they'll see if they can extract the information mm -hmm. from them. Um, they may try to push other boundaries. They may be really late. They may want to sort of keep pushing and keep pushing on things that you know you're already uncomfortable with, but you don't want to be that person. A lot of people have been socialized to go along, to get along, to just kind of go along with what's happening. Oh, come on. It's early. Give the person a chance. They're looking to see how much they can, they can do this. And then the other narcissistic game, and this takes a, a little while to unfold, is they bring this wonderful front game. They're attentive, they're interested, they're fun. And just as the person's getting into it, they withdraw. Mm. They don't text back. You can't get a response. They kind of cancel a few dates. Now the person's on the hook. They've taken a few hits off that pipe, basically. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, what? Wait, we're having such a good time. What's going on? They ruminate. They stare. Should I text him back? Should I, should, do, should I call her back? What do I do? What do I do? Ruminate, ruminate, ruminate. Okay. Then the narcissist responds after maybe several hours or a day or two. Oh my God, they're into me. Now you're willing to do anything they ask. It's a very clever gambit. It's a, it's a sort of a hard to get kind of a game, but so the idealized seductive presentation, they get the person in, they get the person in. If the person is being strong and having their boundaries and being very clear, right now the narcissist is giving you two faces, fun, 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 intrusive, intrusive. You're like, fun, intrusive. They, the narcissist may not push. The skilled ones won't push. What they do is they pull back just as they sense that interest. And by pulling back, there's where the trauma bond begins. Now you're desperate for them. So when they wait one day, two days, whatever, and get back to you, all that tension relieves and you're putty in their hands. You will, you will allow your boundaries to be railroaded. You'll let them do anything because you don't want to go through another one of those eight hour, 12 hour, 36 mm. hour times that you can reach them. And so, the, and in many ways, it's a very infantile kind of a paradigm. It's like the child who wants to please the parent. Mm. So the parent is always there, but it's, it's, and it's also, it almost feels a little addictive, right? That I don't, I don't ever, I'm going to, I'm going to keep all this. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. So they never go quiet on me again, which often means letting go of all those boundaries and letting the narcissistic person dominate. Now you're all in and you're, and now you're in trouble. Can you then trust if they tell you that they love you or not? Love is the trickiest word in the English language. I don't think there's a trickier one. It means something different to everyone. It means mm -hmm. something different to you. It means something different to me. It means something different to everyone you're going to meet today. 
think we have some universal agreed upon stuff around love, but for a narcissistic person, it's a very shallow experience. It's about validation. It's about attention. It's about admiration. It's about short-term pleasure. It's about what works for them. It's about getting their, them getting their needs gratified. It's about you making them look good. That's what they mean by love. Mm. For the other person in the relationship, love may mean empathy, compassion, depth, sticking through good times and bad, loving a person unconditionally, whether they're attractive, whether they're unattractive, they put on weight, if they get pregnant, if they're not as sexy anymore, it's, it's a longer term, mutual, I love you, you love me, I support your growth, you support my growth. Those are two very different mm. definitions, right? So can you trust them when they say, I love you? They love you, but the problem is you don't know what their definition of love is. Mm. If I go to someone ho someone's house and they say, we're having cake for dessert, and they pull out some janky fruit cake, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking about like chocolate frosting and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, I guess this is a cake. <laughs> but to them, it's still a cake. It's still a cake. That's amazing. So would you then, let's say, for instance, someone says they love you, um, and you're not quite sure what that means to them. Would you just ask them? And then how, what would be the difference between your normal person answering and a narcissist actually answering? So here's where it's tricky, right? I think that what happens is, is that it's not as simple as we pull out contracts and say, right. so you know that here's my contract, <laughs> and these are the terms of love for me. And you can see... Uh, item two, clause C, <laughs> is spelling it out this way. And if you agree, please initial and sign. That's not, I, I kind of wish we did it I that know, way. Because right? then, like, I know what my love contract would look like. Oh, and so someone mentioned? else might be like, mm, I'm, I'm sort of not feeling the unconditional love piece. So can we just sort of take that clause out kind of thing? But if you were to go to a narcissist and say, what does love mean to you? A narcissistic person is not psychotic. They're not delusional. Well, they're moderately delusional, but fully delusional. They know what the right answer to the test is. Oh. Okay, so they'll say, well, love is like basking in your glow and, and like respect and being there with you all the time and just loving on you. And they might give you a vague answer, right? They, and I think that one of the hard parts of, of love, and this is something I've said over and over again, and it's a big part of the trauma bond. If you ask people in a trauma bonded relationship, so not the narcissist, but the other person, okay? And you say to them, why do you love this narcissist? Can you tell me? And it happens with me clients all the time. And the answer invariably is, I don't know. It's like uh, it's something, kind, it's like magical. And we sort of have this, like with this connection, it's like this deep connection. And like, I just feel them and they feel me. And I'm like, okay. Uh, the second you can't articulate okay, it. They can't articulate it. Mm. But when you ask a person in a healthy relationship, mm. I would ask you that question about Tom. And I have asked you that question about Tom. The answers end up becoming very much like, I respect him and he respects me and we have a wonderful time together and we have shared values and I feel safe with this person like mm. they give you concrete stuff right so I, I'm thinking uh, we laugh together whatever it may be I um at the end of the day this is the only person I want to talk to they hear me what whatever the mm. list is I'm like oh I get it but when someone's like magical can't describe you can't describe it because it's a trauma bonded mm. sort of confused space the challenge then becomes in a narcissistic relationship. The person will turn around and said, you say you love me, but you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this. And that's not love. Well, maybe it's love to them. You never ask them. God, that's so true. And because you talk about how confusing it can be for people. So, so confusing. Because, you know, you're with someone and they tell you they love you. And maybe they're saying it in the way that like all your instincts are like, okay, it feels right. It's matching everything that I've learned about love. Mm -hmm. um, and then before you know it, within an hour or something, they're devaluing you, they're gaslighting you. And then they flip again mm -hmm. and then they show you the love. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be so confusing, confusing for people to be able to assess how they feel about themselves mm -hmm. or how their partner feels about them. Mm -hmm. But then also you start to question yourself mm -hmm. I tell people, do you feel safe? Do you feel safe? And we often, when we talk about love, we talk about romance, we talk about fun, we talk about sex. What we don't talk about enough is safety. 
And to me, that might be actually hot, top of the list when we're talking about love, because true love, healthy love is safe. And when I say predictable, I don't mean boring but that you feel that you can roll up to this person and be yourself. doesn't mean they're always going to agree with you. It doesn't even mean they're not going to be angry at you. But their anger will be expressed in a way where you still feel safe. You may not agree. You might even get into a big argument. All that's fine. But you feel safe. Why? Because you can say, All right, I see why they're angry. I get it. I don't agree. We're going to go, go, go. But at no point did you feel like you, it was almost predictable. There was, there was a predictability to it, right? In narcissistic relationships, people don't feel safe because they don't know what's going to set the narcissist off. It's like living in a minefield, right? right? And that inconsistency, that backing and forthing, really comes down, interesting, I'm using this word safe, does the narcissist feel safe? And it's not with you, it's in the world. So if the narcissistic person has a good day, they get a promotion at work, they get a lot of likes on social media, somebody tells them they're hot in the gym, they're feeling good. That's their idea of safety. They feel really validated. So that's when they're going to come home and sweep you off your feet and say, babe, let's go out to dinner. You're my girl. I love you. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, I'm so in love. Okay. If that day they didn't get the promotion, someone else did. They didn't meet their, meet their quota. People didn't like them on social media. They, somebody got into a fight with them at the gym. They're going to come home and start screaming at you. You're thinking, I don't get it. Like I, and everything could be the same. Because they're so driven solely by their internal world with no regard for how their behavior hurts or affects other people. You never know what you're going to get. That's not safe. It's like not knowing if you walk into your house, if there's going to be someone in your house that's going to be a danger to you. That's terrifying if you think of it that way. And so I unfortunately have to take this really cynical position where I say, if, if you feel, if this person is able to do these cruel things. I'm not saying anger, I'm not saying arguments. I'm saying just downright cruel mm -hmm. and unpredictable and not be accountable for that behavior. You, you gotta judge this relationship on those bad days, not the good days. And too many people judge narcissistic relationship on the good days. Wow, oh my God, you're so, so right. And it gives us a certain feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, but I, I felt great on this day with them. It obviously was because mm -hmm. they were having a good day um, and had nothing to do with mm -hmm. me. Um, that was so freaking strong. And especially when you even said, it's not actually like, are they feeling mm -hmm. safe? That becomes a helpful predictor, yeah. if you will, yeah. because that, be like not knowing um, how someone's going to react to you, how someone's mm -hmm. going to respond to you, whether they're loving on you or whether they're just downright abusive mm -hmm. to you, um, isn't a way to live. Mm -mm. No. And it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So having these understandings, because now at least I can take this information and then put in a plan for myself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so people listening, instead of feeling like they're on edge, like you're not sure what to get, to have these moments where they can step back and look at the situation and go, okay, how am I gonna respond if they're like this? How am I mm -hmm. gonna respond if they're like this? Um, that becomes beautiful. Um, now, what do you do though? Let's say you're working on yourself and let's say you recognize that you're in this relationship that isn't healthy. And so you recognize these turbulent moments. And so now you start to work on yourself. How do I show up? What is the pre-work that I can do? Um, and the narcissist partner spots it. They start to see that you are now becoming, stepping into your own. You're now being mm. becoming independent. You are now taking ownership over mm. how you show up. I mean, you're, you're shaking your head. They so. don't like that. They don't want you to be strong. They don't want you to succeed. They don't want you to get away. And they sure as heck don't want you to be independent. Narcissism is about dominance, power, and control. So this idea that they want you to fly off and, and or achieve your potential, not so much, because that's a threat to them. Mm -hmm. You will never be able to soar higher than the narcissist can, right? In fact, there's an old, um, an old children's fable it's called the eagle and the wren. And the eagles obviously could fly much higher than all the other birds. And so they decide to have a big contest to see which bird could fly the highest. Well, the wren is a small bird. So the wren tucked into the eagle's feathers. And then at the very top of the race, it went over 
the eagle. You would think like, go wren. But actually in the story that all the other birds like kind of kill the wren. They peck the wren to death. How dare you do this to the eagle, what? right? So it's like the fairy tales even mm. sort of enable the, the, I guess in this case, the eagle is the narcissist. But the narcissist sets up the game that nobody gets higher than them. So let's say you're with a narcissist who's killing it. Like they're doing great, right? They may actually be able to tolerate a partner getting up to a certain level, but never exceeding them. Right. So that's why some people say, no, there's this person and they're, yeah, they're narcissistic, but their partner's doing well. I'm like, are the, is a partner doing better? And they're like, no, but they're doing well. I said, it's not, it may be well compared to you, the sure as hell isn't better than the narcissist. So narcissistic people, when they sense, and in fact, it, when you even get out of a relationship with them, they will, and they see you getting happy, they'll ruin that happiness. They can't, the, to, the, to the narcissistic person, the only frame of reference is theirs. How dare you, you go succeed and be happy. I'm going to wreck this for you. And so if you're in the relationship with them, and I think a lot of people are thrown by this in narcissistic relationships because early on they'll be like, oh, that's cool. And I'm, that's like, they'll almost think that this new person's success will reflect well on them. Mm -hmm. But over time, if they sense that that person's success is going to eclipse theirs or things aren't going well for the narcissist and the person with them is actually doing better, the narcissist will shut that down. They will, and that, that right there, in a healthy relationship, both partners support the success of the other. That's how we know it's a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's not a person saying, they're getting successful. I better knock them few, down a few notches so they don't, they don't get uppity or they don't leave me right? That's the insecurity. And there is that insecurity for narcissistic folks. Despite the power, the dominance, the control, which makes them look like a bully, they're actually also afraid of being abandoned and left behind because at the core of them is very, they're very fragile. So when we feel, when you feel that fragile and you're not in touch with that fragility, you're going to dominate. A person who's in touch with their fragility may say, gosh, my partner is really succeeding and I, I'm a little worried. Like, am I going to, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if I can keep pace or they're going to want to keep me around. And then that becomes a conversation saying, I am so happy for you. And yet I'm having this, this sort of neurotic fear and a healthy partner would say, hey, uh, you know, this is us together and they'll, there'll be a soothing. And then that other person will hear that and won't stay as much in that neurotic space. And will actually, and then the the succeeding partner will say, hey, I see this potential in you. Like, let's use the success I'm having to uplift you. And then both boats rise. But that's only in a healthy relationship. In a narcissistic relationship, no. And I think people get thrown by the narcissist not being happy for them. And then I've seen a lot of people blame themselves saying, oh, what was I thinking telling them my good news when they weren't having a good day? And I'm oh, saying, yeah. It's, it, you should, it's a relationship. You should always be able to share. You shouldn't have to think like, ooh, let me assess what kind of day they've had before I tell the fragile narcissist my good news so they don't go crying and yelling and screaming. That's not a relationship. That's really toxic babysitting. <laughs> so if you're in this relationship then and you're starting to see all this and you try to put up boundaries like you know look don't let someone you know this person's a narcissist don't let them cross you so you're starting to work on yourself you're starting to put up these boundaries you're starting to yeah. try and gain more confidence and you know that the narcissist is never going to like that mm -hmm. to your point mm -hmm. and so i've heard you talk about they'll try and punish you yeah so where is that fact so a i'd love to talk about the types of punishments mm -hmm. that people can recognize that behavior mm -hmm. and then b so where is they're left to go mm -hmm. like are you able to still put up boundaries in a narcissistic relationship or is that always going to be met with a narcissist coming with a sledgehammer to try and break them mm -hmm. yeah boundaries are never going to work in a narcissistic relationship because when you set boundaries you're exerting an equal amount of power mm -hmm. you're saying we're not we're not doing this you're saying you're basically saying i have power and worth in this relationship too and there's no room for that in a narcissistic relationship. They're not going to hold space for someone exerting their own sense of self. So you don't get to have boundaries mm -hmm. in that relationship. So that's not even an option. How, there's a lot of different ways that narcissistic people punish people. They abandon people. They withhold from people. They uh, humiliate people. They embarrass people publicly. They... Um, they find a little mistake someone makes. So let's say a person is um, succeeding, 
they're in a narcissistic relationship but things are going well but then one day something doesn't go well the thing you're building and there's a bad meeting or someone turns you down the narcissist will say oh well someone was getting ahead of themselves so they'll mock you and they'll passive aggr passive aggressively bait you but it's all punitive mm. you know whether it's in your face whether it's passive aggressive or whether it's them withdrawing and for some people they'll say oh if i succeed i'm going to lose my partner to which i say then what the hell kind of relationship is this I th does that come back to the fear then it's like you know yeah. yes it doesn't feel like a great relationship but you know, I assume narcissists very much will use like, well, you're going to be all alone. What are you going to do without me? Mm -hmm. I think I've told you in a past episode that I had an ex-boyfriend that said to me, no one's going to love you as much as yes. I love you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they start to use that language mm -hmm. to press on the fear buttons right. that you have. Mm -hmm. So that the idea of fear at its most extreme is what we see in sort of coercive or coercively controlling relationships where everything is governed by fear. But I'd argue that fear is the heart of the narcissistic relationship, right? It's fear that they're gonna leave you. It's fear that you're gonna say the wrong thing. It's fear of their rage. It's uh, fear of saying the wrong thing. You're constantly afraid of doing or saying or being the wrong thing. So as a person is in a narcissistic relationship, they shrink. They shrink to something that can never offend or mm -hmm. get attention away from or bother the narcissistic person and they also become quite isolated so because there's a lot of shame now that you shrink you don't even want people to see your shrunken self so you withdraw and you lose that support and that support is essential if you're going to ungaslight yourself the only way to ungaslight yourself is to have people supporting the reality that you witness and see. So that the fear governs everything in a narcissistic relationship. But also, Lisa, there's societal fears. People are afraid of being single. People are afraid of being right. alone. People are afraid they're getting older if they want children. They can't have children. Um, th these, kinds of, these kinds of fears that might even be independent of the narcissistic relationship, but yet the person stays in it because they might say, well, this person does make money, and, mm -hmm. and like there's these, these, these sort of those societal check boxes, like successful or attractive or whatever they may be. And I want to say the check boxes need to be respect, compassion, mm -hmm. kindness, safety, new check boxes, new checklist. But it's that idea, too, of how people will pathologize people for leaving what looks at least on paper like a good relationship and then the fear people have of am I going to always live alone am I going to grow old alone to which my response is usually I don't think you're going to grow old alone but alone is better than this mm. at least you can cultivate friendships and go on a vacation without being screamed at and purchase non-generic food without being yelled at whatever it is that's getting the narcissist's goat like you can do these things without constantly living in fear but Lisa I got to be frank with you because I work with people of all ages from as young as like late teens all the way to their 70s and 80s and as people get older that does become a fear they'll say it's hard to date when you're in your 60s right. or 70s and people say it's it it feels more unsettling to be alone when I'm older but there's a real tragedy in the sense of, I said, you're nuts if you think this narcissistic person's going to take care of you as you get older and more infirm. And in fact, the heartbreak for some people is they endure years, decades of a toxic, abusive, fear-inducing, narcissistic relationship. Well, at least I won't be old alone when I'm old. They do get sick, break a hip, whatever, and they're older. That narcissist doesn't want to take care of them. And after all those years, they recognize they actually were alone all along. Wow. So I know I'm telling you this story on the back end, and we're talking about first dates. No. But, but... I got to tell you, folks, that first date, as nuts as what I'm going to say is going to sound, you're 28, you're a beautiful young thing, the world is your oyster. Someday someone else may be wiping your ass. You better be sure that they're up to the job. <laughs> I really love that chick out. That was so fire. It never dawned on me. It never dawned on me that you're hoping because you don't want to feel alone. So you think that you're um, acting um, to protect yourself. Right. And then when you get there, it never dawned on me mm -hmm. that there's no way they're even going to be there to take care of you. Mm -hmm. So that was so freaking fire. Um, okay, there was so much there. 
I really want to touch on when you were saying about how you shrink when a narcissist mm -hmm. is really trying to pull you down. In those moments of shrinking, I would assume things like your self-esteem, how you f see yourself, all go down with mm -hmm. it. Like you don't think of yourself very highly. Um, maybe the your view on the world changes. Maybe your own um, morals may change. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what words to use there. Um, and I've seen people who have done that and it leads to them now not acting in accordance with who they want to be. Mm -hmm. So they basically sink to the narcissist level mm -hmm. because they're getting hurt. The narcissist is throwing words at them. It hurts, it stings. Over time, they shrink lower and lower. Mm -hmm. They feel worse about themselves. And now they're in a position where in those moments where the narcissist is making them feel very, very small, the only defense mechanism they have is to um, throw hate back at them, to throw words at them that maybe the narcissist has used to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That also breaks my heart because now you're becoming a person yeah. that you don't want to right, be. Right, right. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent that? Or, uh, not or, but and, if you find yourself doing that, how do you get yourself back out so that you don't see yourself as being a cruel person, a right. mean person? So anyone who's tuning in today can actually circumvent all of that. I'm going to tell you what I tell people on my YouTube all the time, people I work with all that, which is don't go deep. What do I mean by don't go deep? And I've said that here on, mm -hmm. on Women of Impact before. Don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, and don't personalize. The don't engage is a big piece, okay? You're going to shout back. You're going to attack back because you still think there's hope here. If you've ended all hope, then you're not going to engage with the person, right? So I am not going to start having an argument with somebody I don't know. There's no, there's no point. I don't know this person. There's no stakes. But the, the getting into it with the narcissistic person, using their language against them, they're not listening to you. If I can only reiterate something, they are not listening to you. They don't care what you have to say. They don't view you as a separate human being with separate needs and wants. They don't care. So that can help you hold back from the edge of no matter what I say to this person, it doesn't matter. So I'm just not going to say anything. Mm -hmm. And you can, because I agree with you, what some happens for some people is after spending enough time in the abyss, they, after peering into the abyss, they fall into the abyss, mm -hmm. right? They, they become the monster. Yeah. And that is not unusual because you're engaging with this, this, this difficult, cruel person so much. And then, then it does really feel like the narcissistic person's winning. But in a way, what we do is we acculturate to our circumstances, right? So if I moved to another country right now, I would start learning the language. I would dress the same way. I'd learn their food and their mm -hmm. customs, right? I'd acculturate. Yeah. Now, it's healthy acculturation, right? But there can be unhealthy acculturation. So you may move to a place where actually you're having to become a lot more, I don't know, defensive or have to live in a way that's much more edgy because it's not as safe. And then you try to bring that back to your life that was safe. And people are like, what are you doing? You know, and it's the same thing in a narcissistic relationship. You acculturate and you acclimatize and you assimilate to the culture of the narcissist and you become something you don't like. So how do you start recognizing that behavior because it becomes a pattern, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, especially if you've been with someone for a while, it's become so habitual, you're just used to it, you're mm -hmm. now lashing back out at them. Right. Um, I assume the more you start to act like that, the more it will become a part of you or like it'll be harder to kind of maybe pivot. Oh. It, it may be. I, I don't know that if it's not inherently your nature, then maybe not as much. Mm. I guess the piece we always have to go back to is the radical acceptance piece. Mm they're not going to change. So nothing you do. So if I scream at the sun and say, son, I'd much prefer a few rows in the west. I'd love that morning sun on my face. My, morning, my bedroom window faces west. And so I'd love to wake up to the sun. Scream at the sun. Tell the sun to go F off. Sun's not going to start rising in the west. Same thing with a narcissistic person. There's nothing you're going to say to them that's going to change it. And I think that if a person's really getting into it with them, there must be some belief that things can be different. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you things can't be different. Mm -hmm. This is it. And part of it is understanding what it is. 
I will tell you this though, Lisa, for a lot of people, most people, not all, but most, once they get out of the primary toxic or narcissistic antagonistic relationship, they start popping back to not being so combative, mm -hmm, not, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? They come back to themselves right. if that's not who they were in the first place. And frankly, the vast majority of people and narcissistic people aren't yelling and screaming. They're becoming smaller and smaller and shrinking and silenced, not getting into it with them and not getting, you know, not screaming and yelling. It's just not so the, the norm. Opposite it's quite happens. different. Yeah. And most people get quite silenced. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so if you're being silenced and you're over time really trying to build yourself back, you see everything that's happening, you, you know, you've maybe missed the flags, but now you're seeing them, you're understanding the relationship you've gotten into and you're starting to notice. And then I think you call it the army of the flying monkeys mm -hmm. come at you. Mm -hmm. How on earth do you defend against the army of the flying monkeys? If you don't mind explaining what that is. And then right. So the flying monkeys are the enablers around the narcissist, the person, the people, I should say, who don't either get it, who are benefiting from the narcissistic person, who may even have some slight characteristics themselves, but they, they're, they're still not aware you know, and awakened to what all of this is. So they fall for the narcissistic person's manipulation and smear campaign. If a narcissist perceives that you've done them wrong, they're going to tell anyone who will stand still long enough. They'll do it on social media. They'll do it to people who talk, they talk to. And they're going to get ahead of you on that. Listen, if anyone's in a relationship and their partner went around and said, hey, I just wanted to tell you my, part, my, my girlfriend or wife was behaving in a really shady way. She was texting these guys. She was doing this. None of it's true. You don't even know it's being said. And everyone starts giving you the cold shoulder or is talking badly or rudely to you like, what? You know, you're, you're as confused as can be mm. because a narcissistic person will have no problem actually spreading lies about you. And you, that, that's just, if someone's doing that, you, you can't sort of win at that game. So when that happens, I tell people those smear campaigns and that post-separation period, especially if you've ended the relationship or somehow you've angered the narcissistic person and the smear campaign become, begins and the flying monkeys are these people that the narcissist was able to manipulate and mobilize. You can't win if you try to take it on head on. You won't stop it. And this is not, I mean, this is not going to be that soothing for people. I say, but you just learned who your people are. Mm. Because if somebody who knows you could have been turned and manipulated mm. that easily, they weren't yours in the first place. It's a way to clean house. Now that's mm. destabilizing if that's a lot of people in your world. But wouldn't you want to know that now than just walk around in a fantasy for another 10, 20, 30, 40 years, believing that these are your people, but they could have turned on a dime? I view it as like, I don't know, um, somebody coming and stealing all your stuff out of your closet. I'm like, yeah, thanks for getting rid of these clothes. They don't fit me anyhow. Bye. You know, it's a, it's just a, it's a cleaning out. It doesn't feel that way. Initially, there is grief. There is trauma. Again, talking to someone recently who'd gone through a cult where there had been smear campaigns and all of that. He said, actually, more painful than going through the narcissistic abuse were the flying monkey friends and the smear campaign and losing these people I thought were friends. Because you may not have had a toxic thing with that friend until the narcissist got to them. And that's when the friend turns on you, right? So you were friends, you were doing your thing, you were hanging, and then one day your friend is cold to you. And you're saying, what? And it's because the narcissist manipulated them. It's a grief like no other because it wasn't about what happened between you and the friend is that the narcissist was able to get in there. But it, it does bring me back to that point. How could the friend have been turned so closely? I want you to reflect on some of your closest friendships. I'm sitting here and reflecting on that now. Mm. And my closest people, and it's not a long list. I'm very discerning about who's on my list of my closest friends. I couldn't be turned. And if somebody came to me and said something like that, the first thing I would do is said, call my friend and say, yo, such and mm. such just told me this and this. Talk to me what's happening. I wouldn't turn on the friend and say, how could you? And believe some manipulative person. Mm. And so it becomes this taking stock of this friend then thought I was capable of this. So it does become a new way of viewing it. I'm not saying you're not full of grief, 
I'm not saying you're not full of loss, but you've just learned something that you can never unsee. Ladies, 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 I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dream, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. Oh, okay, well, I've got a question for you. Would you not at all even look at the friend and say maybe, um, almost having grace for your friend and saying, wow, they're... They either were conned by the narcissist, they got tricked by the narcissist, they're weak, and I don't actually mean that as mm -hmm. an insult, I actually mean that mm -hmm. they've got some past traumas mm -hmm. that they've brought in, and so this narcissist comes in, has told them something, and because of their belief of maybe, because of the narcissist, because of the influence it has, they've believed the narcissist, but it actually isn't about you. Right, well, the, the, it means the friend got played the way, frankly, Correct. you got played, right? But that requires the friend talking to you. So the friend just shuts you down, oh, okay. which is a lot of what more than a few flying monkeys have done, got it. right? So I, I'll push back on you there a little bit, Lisa. Yeah. I agree with you, because now you're like, oh, they were just played like I was. Yeah. Like so let's say you go to said friend and said, hey, you just got played by them too. Yeah. And your friend says, no, I wasn't. And, and then they, they're doubling down on the narcissist narrative. How long do you now try to right. enable the friend? The friend's got to go do their work. Right. You have already been embattled by mm -hmm. this relationship. You can't go out there and run narcissist victim survivor camp. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to, you can, you can go in there once and say, hey, they got to you the way they got to me. Got and then the friend says to you, I, I actually, I believe them. Now you're, I, I, I think at that point, going back in there more is not good for you. But having that initial discussion with them. Having that initial discussion, them, yes. Okay, yeah. Unless the friend has stonewalled you. Right. Then you're sunk. Right. So the stonewalling is a big sign of... They've really, they, it's almost like a cult. Right. They're all in on the cult. And I think that you're absolutely right. We can have, and I do think we do need to have compassion for people who are getting sucked in by the narcissist them, themselves. Right. The difference here is that this person knows you, right? And mm -hmm. so they still, and I guess you're right. There's the heartbreak around, wow. Like, because many people will say, you know, I got played too because that smear campaign, the flying monkeys, they'll do it to you while you're in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So you're in a relationship with them and they'll say, hey, you know, your sister's been saying this about you or you know, your friends are really rude to me or they'll start speaking badly about family members, friends, colleagues. Now that's the narcissistic game of isolation. The more they isolate you, the more they can gaslight you, the less support you have, the less, um, because you have a less support you have less i don't know power is the right word but less strength in the relationship mm -hmm. do we tend to see that in more severe narcissistic relationships but going back to the original premise of what we've been talking about in terms of dating mm -hmm. it's early in the relationship and the narcissist is questioning you wait why are you going out with your friends tonight like why aren't you going out with me if a person early in the relationship is trying to snap you out of spending time with your friends and the relationship because that, if they cannot see that you have a life separate from theirs, and they're and they're manipulating and guilting you, and saying, well, well, aren't you that into me? If you're choosing your friends over me, friends and other social relationships are an essential part of a healthy human being. And if somebody rolls up and says, no, it's all me, it's all me, cancel those plans, can't I come along? And it's early. Absolutely it's the not. early that it's, it's the it's early even later i have to be frank with you yes obviously you're 10 years into a relationship and there's a family matter that's urgent and you have to say to your friends listen i gotta bail out today because we're having this problem at home sure but you're on your third date and it's uh, you have plans with a bunch of friends on a thursday night standing plans you have and they say oh come on like why don't you want to spend time with me i guess you're not that into me 
say, no, my friends are really important to me. And they say, well, I guess you're not that into me. And say, if that's how you're going to assess it, then, okay, then I think we're going to have to part ways because my friends are really important mm -hmm. to me. Do not, they, your friends become a lifeline. So early on, they can manipulate you mm -hmm. and to try to pull you away from your friends. So yeah, your friends could be vulnerable to a narcissist and be turned against you as well. And we tend to see that down the line. Let's say a person gets married to a narcissist and they're in a 10, 15 year marriage, that narcissistic person can definitely get into the ears of in-laws and all of that because there's these long, there might be long-standing mm. connections. But if they early on try to say, choose me, why them? I don't understand why you spend time with your friends. You have to be able to say, because they matter to me. People say, wow, I just met this person. I like them. Maybe I could put my friends on ice so I can spend time with this new person. And I'm not meaning, Lisa, if a person meets someone and you say, I'm going to, I'm seeing my friends and they're like, oh, that's totally cool. I get it. You know, I love spending time with you. Um, and then they say, you know, I'm going to be with a bunch of friends myself in that part of town. Hit me up and if we can, maybe you and your friends are done at 1030 and you say, you know, my friends, I, I'm heading home and they're like, oh, I'm at, at this bar near you. Would you like to get together? But they've held space for you to mm. be with your friends. That's a different game. And is it when you, let's say, are saying like, hey, look, now actually I'm going to spend time with my friends. This is really important to me. I've heard you say about how narcissists, when they don't feel special, that's like their big trigger. Correct. And so your friends, in essence, are more special to them, mm. that they feel entitled to all of your time. But it's also a control and dominance. It's that boundary testing. Am I going to be able to get them to say no to their friends? Are they going to pick me? And when you do that, now they're like, there's another place I know that I can control them more. Mm -hmm. If you hold your ground and say, no, I'm going to choose my friends, early on it's conceivable a narcissistic person may end a relationship at that point. Hmm. And actually, speaking of ending a relationship, so we started this episode with the beginning of a relationship and now ending, um, is there a better way? Like, is it better for you to be the one that is initiating the ending or the narcissist? Believe it or not, even though it may not feel this way, the best thing that can happen is if they end the relationship. The key is for you to not go chasing after them. And no, nobody mm. ever likes to be broken up with, especially if you're sort of feeling it, but you've just sort of avoided a whole world of hurt. What we know is especially over time, not maybe not in the first few dates, but three months in, six months, and even a year in, the, the, the period when, if you end the relationship with a narcissist, that what we call that post-separation period can actually be the most risky, at times dangerous, and definitely the most psychologically difficult time of a narcissistic relationship because they feel abandoned, mm. they feel like they've lost control, they feel like someone got something over them, they will punish mm. you, text you obsessively, stalk you, stalk you on social media, smear campaign, um, try to suck you back in. They'll have days they say, you're the best, you're the worst. They'll go back and forth. They become really agitated. It can actually be terrifying. And so when you end it with them, you're going to be much more likely to experience that kind of dysregulated agitation. If they end it with you, you've got to be steadfast and really i always tell people make a list of every terrible thing that happened here you mm -hmm. need to look at that list before you go chase this thing mm -hmm. down right many times we want the thing we can't have that's human nature but to fight against that human nature and say they just did you a favor by leaving because now you can move on with your life but unfortunately because of how trauma bonding works a lot of people get lost in that love bomby excitement Someone else is going to get that now. How can that be? I want that. I don't want someone else to get them. And so people will take them back. That also lets the narcissist know it's like, ooh, once I step away, now I can go back and kind of get away with a lot. It's a really dangerous precedent. So you're better off to, I mean, better off, obviously you can't fool somebody, but um, better off for them to end the relationship. And be the, that when you want them to end the relationship, set boundaries. So you're setting boundaries. You're not giving into their stuff. You're not playing their ground game early in the relationship. Early, they're not going to like that. They can't control you. They can't dominate you. They're not winning. That's not, they're probably going to go find someone else. They may, and may even overlap. Nobody likes being cheated on. And I know I can sit here and it's easy for me to say, well, you just dodged a bullet and great. 
Nobody thinks of it that way. They view that new person as a replacement. They think that other person is better than them. And, and I get that. I, it's, it's, it is, I'm ridiculous if I think I can say to her, oh, you're lucky that they found someone else. No, your heart's broken. Mm -hmm. You feel gross that they went and chose someone else. But if you want them to go, set boundaries. They'll leave. Do you think that there's a moment, though, where you're, you are conflicted? Because mm -hmm. it's like that point of what we were saying earlier about feeling alone, especially if they've gone to find somebody else, mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. is that part of you, if you're already insecure, if the narcissist has already kind of worn you down, that, that makes you feel not good enough, mm -hmm. that that is a reflection mm -hmm. of who you are. Yep, absolutely, because I think that you are, again, it's a tipping point. Mm -hmm. Early on, and I, I, Lisa, I, the thing I want to reiterate is, I think that the narrative we hold is that people who get into narcissistic relationships are broken people. They're, they're not, they have no self-esteem and they have low self-confidence and they come from really awful toxic families. All untrue. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you the number of people I've talked with who are saying, you know, when I met this person, I was at the top of my game. I nice. was in the best shape of my life. Nice. I was loving my career. I had friends. I had a great place to live. Like, I, no wonder I was so attractive because I was in this great place, right? So this isn't the story of the, the, the sort of the shrinking violet, the broken winged bird that the narcissist takes advantage of. This isn't the person with daddy issues. Some of these people say, I love my parents. I have a great marriage. I have a close-knit family. Like it wasn't that. So we want these tidy little explanations. Mm. But no, it's actually because narcissistic people are charismatic and charming and compelling and confident. All the things we're told are attractive in a partner. When you're feeling at the top of your game, that person's going to be attractive too. They initially mirror back some of the best parts of yourself. And then they start cutting those parts off. Alicia was going to say, how do you go from that then? Because you, as you were painting this per per picture of this person, I was like, oh, well, a narcissist wouldn't be able to get through to them because they're already confident. Sure they would. You're... you're you're the bomb, like, look how good we look together. Mm. You know, I'm starting this massive company. I'm going to be a trillionaire. Like, I just, I've got all these connections. I work all the time, but like, I live big. I think big. Like, they're going on in this whole grandiose flight of fancy. They're attractive. They seem to be driving a nice car. Like, they've got that front game. Like, they look good. Or, Lisa, or could be the flip side. You're at the top of your game. You meet someone you're attracted to, and they're kind of down on their luck. Like, you know, I have these big dreams, but, you know, things, things haven't launched for me. They haven't gone the way I wanted. I thought I had investors. I didn't. Or I thought, you know, I got into this school and then I had this problem, blah, 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 whatever. And you may have had your own bumps in the road and now you're doing well. And you're thinking, oh, I want to encourage them because I would have wanted someone to do that for mm -hmm. me. And from a very empathic place, it's not always the flashy person. Sometimes it's a person who's a little down on their luck. An empathic person will identify with that and say, things are going well in my life. I want to pay that forward. Mm -hmm. And you may get lost in, the, in the, you know, the bottomless pit of trying to rescue a more vulnerable narcissist. So it can play out both ways. What are the acts of a vulnerable narcissist then? Initially, they're not going to look resentful and sullen, all the things they are. They're going to look down on their luck. Mm. They're going to look a little sad, maybe even socially anxious and awkward. So if you do have empathy, you might say, ah, oh, this person is just, in fact, you would never even think narcissists. They're not grandiose right. or pretentious. They're kind of anxious and awkward and, and say, ah, oh, yeah, I had all these big dreams, but none of it worked out. Or, and you keep hearing that. You see somebody whose dreams were thwarted. It might take you a few weeks to recognize everything's always someone else's fault. Mm. Nothing ever works out for them. Everyone's out to get them. You start noticing that, but you might have already started buying into their narrative by then. Wow, so is that all applied to if it's like a parent or someone in your family? What do you mean by that? So for instance, like all these things that we're talking about, about how a narcissist shows up. And so if you've been brought up in a family where you have someone who's a narcissist and you've had the flying monkeys mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. being in your family and you've tried to really build your self-esteem, you've really tried to build yourself, but you still keep getting your family um, who is making you, uh, who ah. is gaslighting mm -hmm. you, who is making mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. how do you still um, suggest the same actions on stepping back, mm -hmm. putting up those yeah. boundaries? 
What's so hard for some people who come from narcissistic family systems, where all these dynamics exist, right? The power, the domination, the control, the manipulation, all of that stuff's happening within the family. And a person feels they can't grow, they're gaslighted, they're confused, but they manage to distance from the family and they do whatever it is they do and they start to succeed. They start feeling more whole and, and, and separate. Maybe they move across the country or across the world, whatever it may be. But then they have contact with that family system again or mm -hmm. those people keep reaching in and they'll feel like the family's like kryptonite. They'll say, as long as I'm away from these folks, I'm doing fine. But then I talk to my family and they're passive aggressive or they poke fun at me or they, um, they literally are mean to me to my face or tell me I'm just, you know, I, I don't deserve what I get. Whatever it is they say or gaslight me or tell me I'm not all that or do I even know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is. It will make a per it'll fill the person with self-doubt right away. So yeah, the play is disengagement, boundaries, not always easy with a family of origin, depending on culture, mm -hmm. depending on um, not wanting to feel alone or isolated, saying, you know, uh, this is my family, if I don't have my family, then what's left? Mm -hmm. But if you keep staying in that dance with them, I always view a narcissistic family as like those those big sand those sandbags you put on a hot air balloon to keep it down that they'll keep your balloon down. The only way your balloon is gonna fly is if you, if you throw, toss those bags down, and that means distancing and disengaging from your family. Wow. Have you seen any or ever met people who have been brought up in a narcissistic family and then follow that pattern? They take it into like their dating world and maybe marriage, long-term relationship, and they're not actually able to identify that it's been narcissism throughout their entire mm -hmm. oh, life. All the time, all the time. I mean, the only way I can describe that is indoctrination. If you grow up in a cult, it's pretty natural to go into another cult right. or stay in the cult, right? And so when you grow up with it, it's, it's, your, it's your version of normal. Mm -hmm. And especially if that narcissistic family isolated you, but on top of that, the narcissistic, you might be ashamed. So you're like, oh, other families seem different than mine, but kids don't question. The parents in a nar or parent or parents in a narcissistic family system really never allow their children to develop their own sense of self. They mm -hmm. project a lot of shame on them. If you have needs, if you have feelings, emotions, anything, the narcissistic parents will shame you for having those. How dare you expect something of us? You owe us, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So with that mindset, you go into adult relationships feeling like you have to earn love. You have to give up your needs. Your needs are secondary to the other person's. So you recreate that cycle. And so there are people who stay in that narcissism haze literally for their entire lives, from the day they're born till the day they die. That's not, that's not unusual at all. And it's tragic. Yeah, is there any way to um, help someone? Like if you notice that someone in your life is actually with someone um, in a narcissistic relationship and maybe you've identified exactly what you just laid out, so if you, someone dear to you, could be a sibling, could be a friend, anyone, it's going through this. The last thing you want to do is hit them over the head with it and mm -hmm. say, your boyfriend's a narcissist, right? They're going to be like, what? And they'll actually, they might even distance from you, especially if they're still very trauma bonded inside the relationship. What you may want to start with is say, always check in with somebody, say, hey, are you okay? Like, it, you, you mm -hmm. seem, it's, it seems that things have been a little different and difficult for you. I'm just checking in. Give them the door to share what's happening in their life. They may then start sharing patterns in their relationship. Oh, I don't know. It's sort of like I can never get it right. With And they'll give you the whole litany of things. Listen to them. And then say, you know, it's so interesting. I'm hearing a pattern here and I'm a little bit worried because they don't really seem to have that much empathy for you. And it seems to be their way or the highway. You build the pattern out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, at that point, you might want to say, listen, I don't know if this is what's happening, but give them a resource. Mm -hmm. That resource could be anything. It could be this episode. Or Dr. Romani's Your, podcast. My <laughs> podcast, my, my YouTube episodes I've done with you, a book. Say, listen, I don't know if this is what's happening, but give this a look. If it fits, mm -hmm. great. If it doesn't, great, right? Don't shove the agenda. Meanwhile, you're thinking, 10 alarm flyer, oh. fire, narcissist. And then they may read it, they may not. Um, and maybe they will. And they might say, wow, this is my life. How did this person read my mind? I get this all the time. People say, do you have a camera in my house? Are you watching? I'm like, sweetie, I can't make my own cameras work half the time. So no, <laughs> I don't have a camera in your house. But um, 
Mm. In many cases, I'd say over half, the person will say, ay, ay, ay. And maybe they'll get into therapy. Maybe they'll open up to you more. I would say that, though, as a friend or a supporter, you can't have an agenda. I know your hope might be mm. they get out of this relationship. Mm. And you feel disappointed if they don't. Sometimes the best you're going to be able to do is be a support to this person and say, I'm here. And if they finally say, yeah, I agree. I read these books, this article, watch the video, whatever. I agree. I don't know what to do. You don't want to say, okay, all right, this is what we're going to do. You're going to say, I get that. This is going to be a step-by-step -step process. I'm here if you want to talk about it. Be that place where you can be the anti-gaslight for them. Oh. And when they say something, say this happened say yeah it sounds like he was gaslighting you I you know that you the, this is a reality check this thing you said happened I was there at that dinner I saw it happen mm -hmm. and now little by little millimeter by millimeter that person gets more and more strength they start getting a little more resolve perhaps over time they get into therapy maybe they will leave maybe they won't but maybe you'll still at least see them get a little bit stronger as their friend and supporter, you can't get invested in the outcome. All you can be invested in is being a good friend to them. And I also say that with sort of an asterisk saying that, and sometimes you'll feel like you're burning out saying, oh my gosh, how many times are we going to go on this merry-go-round? And to those friends, I'll say sometimes forever. They may not get out and they have their reasons, but you may be that ray of sunlight that's coming in through the crack in the, in the prison. Mm -hmm. Be that ray of sunlight because Different people make different deals with the devil. I don't get to sit here and say the only path forward is to get out. Different people make different deals with the devil. Ooh, that really hit me. Yeah, it's so when I think about the friend who's trying to help the, mm -hmm. their, their friend and guide them, um, I think there is always that beauty in the heart of what they're trying to do, yep. right? So it's yep. like maybe they've gone through it themselves. Yeah, maybe course. they've yep. gone through the narcissistic yep. relationship. They realize how difficult that mm -hmm. was. And now they see the signs, right? They maybe see some of the red flags. And your friend goes on this first day, asks all the questions that we just started this episode with. And now your friend actually has a different perspective, though. So let's say yep. you think you haven't seen any red flags and your friend is highlighting all the red flags. Mm -hmm. Because they truly want what's good for you, right? They've gone in a narcissistic relationship. They really care for you. And now, at what point can you actually t trust yourself versus trusting somebody else who's also been there? So it's not even just like you don't know what you're talking about. Like, do you have a way of, like, is it always a self-assessment first? Taking what your friend says as, um, like, and just explore it and not always take it as potential truth. Well, I think that the best any friend can do is say, for example, that example I gave you of isolating someone. Mm -hmm. They pathologize. What do you mean you're going to spend time with your friends? What do you mean you're going to do your family? What do you mean you're going to that work event? Whatever. That is a, a pattern you highlight. That's always an unhealthy pattern. Does that make sense? So there's some things that are absolutes, right? right? A person is chronically late. You know that you're the, you're being left. Your friend is waiting in the restaurant half an hour, forty five minutes, an hour. That's a sign. One time, sure, we can cut everyone some slack there, but that that person didn't learn and say, so, okay, I am going to allow way much more time than I need to get there, even if I that person has to sit there and wait, so I'm not late for this person again. If they're not learning, that those there's some things that are very much absolutes, but that point at which people can I pause you there for yeah. a second? Wouldn't that be just like insensitive? Like, actually, in those moments, that's how I would have perceived it. I wouldn't have perceived it as an absolute trait of a narcissist. See, I wouldn't, it, and I'm not saying it's an absolute trait oh. of a narcissist. I think that all we can do is cobble together these soft signs right, right. and put them together. So you may be in a relationship mm -hmm. with someone who is sweet as can be, warm, kind, compassionate, and they're always late. Right. Okay? Great when they get there. That then implies to me there's an open door to have the conversation mm. saying, I just want to ask you something. Like, we keep saying six, you keep showing up at seven. What is it, it, what's happening? Mm -hmm. Can I understand this? And they might say, ah, I'm in this job where it's hard to get out the door. I say, should we start saying seven? And then you say seven and they're on time, right? So all of this becomes data. Now, if, if the person is narcissistically late, as I call it, and you say, listen, you're chronically late, and they start coming at you like, 
oh, really? Who made you the time police? And aren't you just so much better? You know, I'm really, actually, I'm really busy, and I have an important job. So if you think, like, getting here for a glass of wine is so important, that's narcissistic. Minimizing your need. Minimizing your need instead of recognizing a person saying, I'm, and, and also not getting in touch. So that hour late person who's saying, once again, my, my boss is catching me out the door. Um, I am so, so sorry. I understand if you have to go. Is there a place I can meet you halfway? Like there's a very self-aware, next time we, I, I, I am so sorry. We can't, I, I won't set such an early time. There's a self-awareness and it corrects and you feel like you can communicate. But when you communicate and you're met with this anger and this, this rage and this defensiveness, now this insensitivity has become a problem. Mm. And w I think you say, is it threes? So it's like the, the first rules of threes, time. Yeah, yeah. Rules of threes. So, the first, so the first time it's, it's an incident, the second time it's a coincidence, and the third time it's a pattern. So in things like this, it would be notice the patterns. Notice, notice the, the always patterns. the patterns. Oh, because I think a lot of people will say, come on, when we're first meeting someone, there's always things that are a little wonky. I don't mm. disagree, right? We do something awkward. Maybe that's the day the freeway is closed, whatever it may be, right? And we don't want to text in the car. We don't have our phone set up right or our phone's in the back seat or whatever the, the issue is, is that there is some reason we communicate about it and we are aware of it and we ensure it doesn't happen again all of that stuff happens early on so you and then from that after that first time they're oh so late it's not that anymore mm -hmm. and they are on time and they're very communicative and they're very warm and respectful and kind you write that off as sort of the first date glitch life happens kind of thing the justification of patterns they're always late they're always talking over you. They're um, always criticizing your friends or your work or making fun of what you do, consistently doing that. That's a pattern. And if it's happening when they're supposed to be on their best behavior, mm -hmm. then you're in trouble. That's so true. Would you suggest someone starts writing these down? Because you know, like we, we said earlier, you start to kind of think, is this just me? Am I imagining it? Is it all in my head? Like. Um, am I gaslighting myself? So like, would you suggest people start to write that down when you start to get that uncomfortable feeling? It's almost like a, um, I don't want to say like, a, like to show the validity in there, but to kind of go back and it's like, okay, it's not my imagination. Yes, I actually wrote Correct. that they are, they are like three mm -hmm. times, that they did insult me four times, that they were like this, like, do you suggest mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah, so I would, journaling is, is to me a backbone of a healthy life. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different ways people can journal. People can do what I call the Dear Diary format. Like, Dear Diary, today I got into an argument with my coworker and the proposal got, did end up getting accepted and I went to the, this place for restaurant and had a date and this, like, there's the Dear Diary format. There is the, there's gratitude journaling, there's joy journaling, there is, but I think if you are starting to date someone and it's new, write stuff down patterns good and bad mm. you know really start journaling that because if you're lucky by day three or four the bad stuff is sort of um they ordered their steak well done and that's their <laughs> great sin or they ordered chicken fingers and listen you might say i can't be with someone who orders chicken fingers okay then that's on you all right but the um but you'll notice that the things you're noticing, like, wow, I'm really grasping at straws. I really enjoy this person's company. They're lovely. Mm -hmm. They're warm. But then you may, you know, it also, though, the things you're noticing is that this person isn't consistently available. Like, they, they'll respond a lot, and then they'll go silent, and they'll give an explanation. So here's the thing, Lisa. This is where it gets interesting. You're with somebody. They're communicative. They're responsive. Then a period comes, and three days they go radio silent and then they show up again. You get really frustrated over those three days. On that fourth day, they say, oh, I'm in this funny job where there are periods of time I can't communicate with anyone. They made no effort to say, hey, I'm going into a three-day period where I can't. They didn't do that. Mm -hmm. You then get to ask yourself, am I comfortable with somebody who's this inconsistently communicative mm -hmm. rather than, oh, well, they had a good reason. What works for you? It's okay to say three days of radio silence doesn't work for me. You, Because I think we don't give ourselves permission to say there are some things that don't work for me. We think that that's not nice. You don't have to share those with other people. 
Some people might say, I don't want to date someone with kids. That's fine. Then don't. Some people might say, I don't want to date someone who eats meat. That's fine. Then don't. I don't want to date somebody who doesn't communicate for days at a time. That's fine. Then don't. Mm -hmm. Be clear on that early on mm -hmm. because I think that when it comes to some more obvious things like having kids or something like that, that's clear, right? And that's understandable, whatever. But the things about like, well, they have a really demanding job. You have to say to yourself, are you so besotted with them having this high powered job that you're willing to squelch whatever discomfort you have with somebody who goes silent and doesn't tell you when that's going to come. You have to have that balancing act of what does and what doesn't work for you. And I think a lot of us don't feel that we have the right to say there's some things that don't work for us. Oh my God, it's so true. And I think if you don't do that, you said it earlier about like a microscopic thing. It's like, well, it's fine. And then you go, okay, they act like this, they're late. Well, it's fine. And you end up kind of agreeing to these small things that you think in the moment isn't a big deal, right. but then a year, two years, three years down the line, that's kind of gotten bigger and bigger of the things that you're saying it's right. fine to. And you... What we can call it justification Justification, creep, yeah. Right? It's you, you start with a little one, oh, they're late, well, oh, they've been out of touch for three days. Uh, they, you know, they are cancel plans at the last minute a lot. It's okay, it's okay. Where, where, when, when, when does it stop being okay? give you an example to people say well that's rigid is it rigid i've worked with people for example who do have kids and so they'd say well sometimes i have my kids sometimes i don't i'm trying to date so the nights i don't have my kids are the only times i could have dinner with somebody i don't have the seven night free schedule so when they change plans i can't do it mm -hmm. okay then that's not going to work for you mm -hmm. done finished and that's the, the unwillingness to say, well, I'm going to make it work. And then over time, this person's hiring sitters and turning their schedule upside down and getting into arguments with the co-parent and, and throwing, they're throwing their entire schedule off to suit this person when they recognize somebody who is this flaky with a schedule is just simply not going to work for them. You've got to know yourself. And I think that too many people, in particular women, aren't socialized to say, there are some things here that are simply not going to work. I think too many people are given the discourse of, ooh, you're just lucky you found someone. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. You're deserving. It's not that you're lucky you found someone. You would, you deserve to say, if I'm going to construct an intimate relationship, I need to make sure that there's elements about this that work. And in narcissistic relationships, we justify and justify and justify a many, many different things, not even just this practical stuff, but abruptness and they'll say they might even apologize and that's why it's so tricky that they'll be really abrupt to you one night really rude It'll hurt your feelings and the next they'll say oh, I had a really I had a terrible day with my boss oh okay well they didn't mean it they said mm -hmm. terrible day. and that is more of that testing because now you're justifying rather than saying you know if this is how this person behaves when they have a tough day with their boss this may not work for me mm -hmm. Oh my God. So I love that because here's the thing that is one of the most important things why I started this show, why, why I show up every single day, is how as women do we hold our own power? Do we look at the world mm -hmm. and say, okay, is this something that I want? Is this mm -hmm. something I don't want? Being able to take action, being able to take one foot in, uh, put one foot in, step in front of the other and say, this is the life I want mm -hmm. and I have the power to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so having you on, being able to talk about all these things to me gives the person listening, that person right now that feels like the freaking stuck, with the power back to actually have all the information to then say, okay, this is how I will approach it if I'm finding myself in the first date. This is how I can approach it if it's someone in my life. The thought of feeling powerless, girl, scares the shit out of me and is exactly why I show up every day. Right, and narcissistic relationships, by definition, leave a person powerless. Why? Because when someone overpowers you, Something's got to give, yeah. and we give up our power. To me, from that perspective, is why for women in particular, I hate narcissistic relationships because women struggle enough to have their power in society. Mm. These relationships sap them, and society is increasingly narcissistic. So just having to be in the world these days means we have to give up a lot of power. So when you add mm -hmm. that into the mix, you add these intimate relationships or even work relationships that are characterized by narcissism, 
what happens is we keep giving over more and more and more of ourselves and then we stop believing in ourselves because we cease to believe we have any power in this world. Why would we? Why would we believe we have power? Because the fact of the matter is, is that in order to keep that relationship going, you had to give all of it away. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, doing these shows with you has taught me so much. And um, I was telling you before we started rolling, how many women come up to me, literally go, and they just burst into tears when they see me because of these episodes that we do together. Mm -hmm. And they start telling me their story of how they felt powerless. Mm -hmm. And having watched one of these interviews has then allowed them to take their power back, to leave mm -hmm. that relationship. But then it doesn't stop there. They then talk about all the ways in which it's changed their lives completely, mm -hmm. in their business, in their relationships with their friends, in, um, in their work relationships with their colleagues. And so it is incredible of how much a narcissist, per a narcissistic person in your life can freaking um, splinter so much of the things oh, in your life. Oh, absolutely. Because you've got to remember is that you end up giving away so much of yourself in the relationship that it is, it, it affects all areas of your life. And I, it actually sickens me to think of how much lost potential in women in particular there has been because of narcissistic relationships. Mm -hmm. The number of women who have been silenced. I gotta tell you, the number of great ideas we haven't heard because these women didn't feel that they had the right to share them, to enact their ideas for businesses, for mm -hmm. careers, for how what they, what they could bring into the world because they were so silenced. So the world has suffered from people being so crushed by these relationships. This isn't, I mean, we started again talking about dating and all the love bombing and all that stuff that happens. Yeah, sure, that, that's one way to view it. But when we take the much bigger, wider lens view, the drones eye view on this, this is actually a massive tragedy because it's nothing but lost potential of people who have been silenced by these relationships, sometimes for lifetimes. And I can't tell you how many survivors I have worked with whose lives were thwarted. And I don't necessarily mean it's because they wanted to start the next great big company, but who just simply felt silence and we just didn't even get to feel their presence in the world because they cut themselves out of the mm. world so much. Like these are beautiful spirits who got silence and I personally have had it. I am tired of watching this many people's potentials being cut down by a bunch of people, insecure narcissistic people who can't stand that somebody else belongs on that stage. Amen, sister. Every time I have you on, I'm like, how can we impact the world? Mm -hmm. And so with this episode, it very much was to everything you just said is, well, where's the starting point? Like yeah. maybe if we can catch people, like well, there's different phases, but if we can potentially catch people before they even enter the, rela the narcissistic relationship, um, what are those things? So thank you so much for allowing me mm -hmm. to start there and then taking us through all these different mm -hmm. um, situations and um, uh, circumstances that people may find themselves in. Mm -hmm. Because if you're able to catch them before you start it, that can be very mm -hmm. powerful because now you're not only helping them in the now, you're actually helping them in 10 years from right. now that they're not having to unwind all the 10 years of being in a narcissistic relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, but you even said, even people who are in their 60s and the 70s, that it's, it, it's never too late. Mm. It's never too late. I got, I got an email from somebody who was 80 years old. She said, mm. I left this marriage. And it is never too late because we don't need to look at life as this big totality. I've lost these 30 years. Mm. If you spent 30 days living fully authentic, and in your truth and in yourself and, and in reality that is yours and not dictated by somebody else that, you're, that you feel like you can respect your own point of view, mm. then that's, that's the moment you're in right then and there and everything else has been a teacher and a lesson. So I think a lot of people say, well, it's too late for me now. It's never too late. If you, you would be amazed at how even sharing one story could help somebody else mm. to know that everyone sharing their stories means that people feel less alone because most people who are in these relationships, they feel foolish. You didn't do anything wrong. In fact, your big sin was having empathy and trying to understand another person's point of view. It's the other person, the narcissistic person who took advantage of your empathy and your trust. That's actually very powerful. Like you really saying that because I, I wonder how many people 
beat themselves up for years mm -hmm. about wasting, or they feel like they've wasted years Correct. of their life. Correct. So now it's almost like you've doubled down in the wasting of your life. Yep. Because they say, well, now it's you, you're sorting, you know, good money after bad at that point, right, or bad yeah. money after good, whatever, whichever order yeah. it's in. But it's the, um, but I think that the. Uh, that people do feel that time was wasted. And I say, you know what? We learn our lessons the way we learn our lessons. And you can view the experience, sadly and unfortunately, as a teacher. I mean, listen, Lisa, a lot of life is luck, right? Some people get lucky. They even, they come out of these terrible narcissistic families and they meet someone kind and they fall in love and they have a nice life. Some people come out of great families and they meet a narcissistic person and make a mess of their lives. So there is a piece of luck in there, if you will. But then above and beyond that, when people end up in these spaces, to recognize you did learn something and if you really take in the lesson you learn and you really pay attention to it and don't deny it mm. and don't say well that was just an exception and you are willing to be with it you can learn you know to, you're resolute to your wise you see the world more clearly some people feel like oh it's not more cynical I don't know that it's cynical I mean I think it's actually quite wise mm. you can I think people who want to believe that the world is always this warm fuzzy place Listen, I'd love to live in that warm, fuzzy world. I never have, so I don't know what that is. Mm. I think um, just having your own back, I don't think we're teaching people that enough. I think from a very early age, like, everyone's good and everyone's great. And mm, no, not now. It's not, that's not the time of history we're in right now. So you need to have your own back. And in our, in everybody's quest for a love story, they're not starting with the fundamental mm. need of loving and respecting themselves. With survivors, I sit them down and say, as hard as this is, what did you learn? Mm. What did you learn? And that's not a question I ask for someone in the early phases of survival because I think they're angry, they're hurt. It's probably not the time to do that. But as some of the initial grief dissipates and the person's doing more of the sort of the, the work on managing the anxiety and the sadness, it is time to then start looking at the meaning and purpose questions, right? Mm -hmm. That there is meaning in suffering. So what, what, what was the meaning? What did you learn? And the answers are things from, I'm more resilient than I thought. I figured out how to work the family court system. I never dreamed I'd be able to do mm -hmm. something like that. I, um, I'm more financially savvy than I ever dreamed. Um, I didn't quite even understand what empathy was, and apparently I've got a lot of it. Um, I'm now much more comfortable with my solitude because all I craved was that the narcissist wouldn't come home from work mm -hmm. and now I'm like, ooh, solitude isn't so bad whereas I used to be afraid to be alone. Like the list goes on and on of what people actually learn what their capabilities really are because what does a narcissistic person do? They really keep reminding a person, you're no good without me, you're nothing without me. I think for some people they'll say, I was once I once I was once successful. I once did this thing, and I can go. I I'd like to dust that off, and go back to that. Or you know what? Some people say, Lisa. And to me, there's sometimes the most poignant moments. They'll say, I Look at my kids. I love my kids. Mm -hmm. These kids came from that not so nice person in me, and they don't know that I want another child. And this child, this child had to be in the world. And some people say the world needs my child. And that child, this is the, the part of my journey was this child getting to, you know, me getting to have this journey with them and them getting to have their journey in the world. And so people go to this existential place with it. I know people who said in order to calm the narcissist down, I had to learn to cook like a chef. Now I'm a really good cook and now I'm <laughs> going to go back and I'm going to go to culinary school and, mm -hmm. and firm up my training on this or I'm going to start a catering service. Um, I know people who say I've, I'm teaching um, survivors of domestic abuse how to cook. I'm teaching them financial planning. So they give it to women who have been harmed, even maybe physically also by these relationships. And so people are finding ways to pay it forward, to, to learn, to pay, their, to pay their lessons to others, but also to take back their lives. It, it's, it's quite possible, but it means you can't get lost in that concept of sort of wasted time. I don't know that there was wasted time. Sometimes you learn resilience because you say, if I could have lasted that for 20 years, I can do anything. Mm -hmm.
Homie, I freaking adore you. You Thank are you, impacting Lisa. so many people. You are freaking changing lives. I love every moment that I spend with you. Um, and now I'm so excited for your new podcast that's come out. If you can share where people yeah. can find the podcast. I hope people listen. It's called Navigating Narcissism. You can, you know, I'll, I'll make the link available to you, but you can find it anywhere. You listen, it's on iHeartRadio, so go to their platform, but you can find it anywhere. You get your podcast and subscribe. Our episode, this is very different than my YouTube. It's me talking with survivors of all kinds of narcissistic relationships, some that people are familiar with because they've been in the headlines. There have been documentaries about them. These are people who have survived everything from uh, con men, con women, um, cults, uh, abusive marriages, you name it. We're taking on stories where you might say, well, that's not my story. You may think it's not. But once you start hearing them sharing those common themes of narcissistic relationships, you think, holy cow, like this is all of these relationships are, are this. And so um, I also, for those folks who are interested in healing from narcissistic abuse, I have a, a healing program and I can make that link available to you too. And, um, and people can sign up and it's a monthly program and you get workshops and question and answer and journal prompts and guided meditations and all kinds of things to help people dial down into their healing on a monthly basis. Wow, we'll put all the links below. Thank you. Honestly, I can't get enough of Dr. Romani. Oh, I'm just saying Lisa, it. Guys, you. guys, go freaking check out this woman. If you haven't like seen her before, where have you been? Literally, this woman is everywhere. She's creating so much freaking impact, one person at a time. So guys, go freaking check her out. Her stuff is amazing. If you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Press the subscribe button, because guys, you'll get notified of all new episodes just like this. And if this episode brought you value, please, please do share, let your homies know that Women of Impact is here and creating impact. All right, guys, until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace. Being vulnerable isn't me telling you the same insecurity 10 times a day. That's not <laughs> vulnerability, that's dumping. I'm making you responsible for, for my emotional state every time I feel it. That's not the same thing as vulnerability. Vulnerability is I'm insecure about this.